My name is Anthony Burgess. I'm a novelist, critic, and Shakespeare lover. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation Podcast, Episode 2. Burgess and Shakespeare. Anthony Burgess, always one for self-mythology, liked to believe that he had a familial link to William Shakespeare. Not content to merely be a Shakespeare lover, he also formed the idea that he was related to a Jack Wilson, a boy player in Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men. The historical Jack Wilson is reported to have sung the ballad Sigh No More Ladies in Much Ado About Nothing, as stated in the first folio. Burgess's Jack Wilson had a much more bawdy biography. In Burgess's novel, Nothing Like the Sun, the character has one line, a commencement to baptise the newly built Globe Theatre with copious amounts of wine in nomine kiddy marvoli a Shakespeare. He is given more of a voice in Dead Man in Deptford, where he narrates his sexual trysts with Christopher Marlowe. This dubious link to history aside, Burgess's love of Shakespeare's work is apparent in much of his own writing. Here is Burgess on the Bard. What, ever since my youth, I have found in Shakespeare the pure poet is myself. I do not mean that, as a writer, I could ever approach Shakespeare in talent. I mean that my own nature, which is no more than human nature, is revealed in his work, and above all, in the sonnets. If we can talk of art as having a use, then the use of Shakespeare is the clarification of what human nature is like. We are all will, and sometimes will in overplus. The supreme wordmaster found the words to tell us so, and what astonishing words they are. The influence of Shakespeare on Burgess's work can be seen in many ways, even discounting his famous Elizabethan novels Nothing Like the Sun and A Dead Man in Deptford. Characters such as Enderby, Kenneth Toomey from Earthly Powers, or even Burgess's own Shakespeare can be seen as Falstaff recast, witty but boastful bon viveurs for whom trouble is never far away. Further still, the figure of Shakespeare emerges over and over again in Burgess's fiction. Sometimes this is obvious, as in the Elizabethan novels, and sometimes humorous, as in Enderby's Dark Lady, and sometimes Shakespeare is reflected in the language. Burgess, like the wordmaster bard before him, stretches and manipulates language in much of his writing. His prose often reflects Shakespeare by way of James Joyce, as this extract from Nothing Like the Sun on the subject of love demonstrates. London, the defiled city, became a sweet bower for their lovers wandering, even in the August heat. The kites that hovered or Perched, picked at the flesh of traitors' skulls, become good cleansing birds, bright of eye and feather, part of the bestiary of the myth that enthralled them as they made it. The torn and screaming bears and dogs and apes in the pits of Paris Garden were martyrs who rose at once into heraldic zoomorphs to support the scutcheon of their static and sempiternal love. The wretches that lolled in chains on the lapping edges of the Thames, third tide washed over, noseless, lipless, eye-eaten, joining the swinging hanged at Tyburn and the rotting in the jails to be made heroes of some classical hell that, turned into music by Virgil, was sweet and pretty school-day innocence. With his title of this novel, Nothing Like the Sun, lifted from one of Shakespeare's sonnets, Burgess intends to speak of the difference between the real man and the iconic artist. It also highlights the fact that the novel is a pastiche of Elizabethan English, nothing like the original language of Shakespeare's time. Yet looking at Burgess's biography of Shakespeare, published in 1970, 
he strove to draw parallels between his own life and that of the bard. Outside Shakespeare's literary output, little is known of the man's life, and Burgess jumps on this opportunity to emphasise commonalities with his own experiences. The fact that Shakespeare was from a provincial town and went to neither Oxford nor Cambridge was a great inspiration for Burgess, who saw his own background as similar. He had transcended his working-class roots in Manchester and worked to infiltrate the literary establishment without a classical education at one of the ancient universities. Burgess valued his status as an intellectual and resented anything that took him away from these pursuits. His enforced life in the military, for example, he describes as akin to the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Shakespeare, on the other hand, had different motivations, as Burgess describes in his book, English literature. It is conceivable that Shakespeare's main aim in life was to become a gentleman and not an artist, that the plays were a means to an end. Shakespeare wanted property, land and houses, and that meant acquiring money. The theatre was as good a means as any of making money if one happened to be a man of fair education and a certain verbal talent. Shakespeare was such a man. His eye was never on posterity, except perhaps in his poems, It was on the present. Despite his valuing of intellectual status, Burgess also developed the attitude of a professional writer. In 1959, he was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour, something that inspired him to earn as much money as he could with his writing to support his future widow. Out of this supposed last year of his life came The Doctor is Sick, Inside Mr Enderby, The Right to an Answer, One Hand Clapping, rewrites of Eve of St. Venus and the Worm of the Ring, and early drafts of A Clockwork Orange. Yet much like his own version of Shakespeare, Burgess could not give up his more artistic impulses. He writes... I was born with an artistic instinct. From the earliest part of my life I tried to express this in the form of pictorial art, but my ambition to be the new Cezanne was frustrated because I discovered I was colour-blind. I then tried to become a composer of music, but frustration came out of comparative lack of talent. I still write music, but no longer with the ambition of becoming Britain's Beethoven. Writing fiction is for me a kind of substitute for writing symphonies. I like sounds, musical or verbal, and I like organising them into patterns. I like shapes, forms, structures, and I find satisfaction in fashioning these in the only extended literary form that we have, the novel. This is also true of Burgess's Shakespeare, or W.S. as he is known in Nothing Like the Sun. The character is portrayed as much more than an ambitious and mercenary social climber. He is depicted as a young man trying to make a living, but also trying to achieve sophistication in his art. Describing Shakespeare as his patron saint, Burgess notes that he gave his public more than they asked for, wished to be known as a poet, and died a gentleman and an artist. Burgess's writings on Shakespeare's art effectively dispel the old English teacher cliché that, if he were alive today, Shakespeare would be writing for a television soap. Burgess's Shakespeare would not only have felt such work beneath his gentlemanly status, but also beneath the political, emotional and poetic sophistication he was trying to achieve in his art. Burgess's Shakespeare also carries some other familiar biographical similarities. In Nothing Like the Sun, W.S. eventually succumbs to syphilis after several liaisons with the Dark Lady. While Burgess was not a sufferer of the Morbus Gallicus, He had an experience during the war that made him connect artistic genius with syphilitic brain rot. Burgess started his war in the Royal Army Medical Corps and was posted to a hospital in Winnick, Cheshire that specialised in the general paralysis of the insane. In other words, sufferers of syphilis. In 1973, Burgess told the Paris Review of his experience in the hospital. I discovered there was a correlation between the spirochete and mad talent. The tubercle also produces a lyrical drive. Keats had both. There was one man who'd turned himself into a kind of scriabin, another who could give you the day of the week for any date in history, another who wrote poems like Christopher Smart. Many patients were orators or grandiose liars. It was like being imprisoned in a history of European art. Politics as well. 
Despite there being little hard evidence that Shakespeare contracted syphilis, Burgess's experience of working around the disease has informed his creation of W.S. But this sort of creation was not limited to his fiction about Shakespeare. Taking advantage of the scant detail known about the playwright's life, the conjecture in Burgess's Shakespeare biography also points to the familiar. Towards the end of the biography, Burgess speculates that in his final years, Shakespeare could have possibly been suffering from venereal disease or Berger's arterial blockage. This may sound very specific, but in 1966, Burgess received the same diagnosis after having difficulty walking. Both Burgess's biography of Shakespeare and his novel Nothing Like the Sun try to depict the man behind the plays. But because of a lack of biographical fact, Burgess turns to the literary works in order to create a possible vision of what the man Shakespeare was like. This is literary criticism in reverse, as it is more usual to use details of an author's life to extrapolate meaning from a literary work. But Burgess is following his artistic instinct, and his writings on Shakespeare are the reactions of a novelist rather than an academic. Here, in the first chapter of Nothing Like the Sun, Burgess alludes to many aspects of Shakespeare's plays as he describes W.S.'s early life. W.S. made a wry pinched face flushing. A nipping English spring, he shrugged to say. He pulled his worn cloak closer about him as King Stephen in the song, a worthy peer indeed. But now Richard had finished and was tucking it away. He made little bellowing noises, his hands still there, and ran with a limper's agility after pale-lashed, no-eyebrowed Anne. Pallor the endless winter's pale, sunless England white ghosts coupling in watery light. Anne feigned to be frightened and ran, gleefully screaming towards the bushes. She looked back at her little pursuer crying, boar, boar, bristly boar. Then she raced full tilt smack into the bulky figure that emerged from behind the thick, warty oak bowl. They all knew him. A pallid, some said, on Henley Street. A wild rogue. Jack Hoby his name was. Filthy shirt, old hat with broken crown. A true canvas climber or a freshwater mariner. He was far enough inland, sure. W.S. believed he had known the sea. He was, as ever, cup-shotten. Here Burgess is using details from Shakespeare's plays in order to create a full description of his family life in Stratford. Richard, W.S.'s younger brother, walks with a limp, clearly alluding to a more famous Richard in the Bard's oeuvre. To further strengthen this, Anne's cry of bristly boar alludes to the coat of arms of Richard III, which shows two boars enclosing a shield. Richard in Burgess's tale would later become the villain of the piece, being found in the bed of W.S.'s wife, Anne. The inland mariner, Jack Hobie, has a vaguely Falstaffian nature with his bulk and roguish drunkenness, but Burgess claims this character was there to inspire W.S.'s vision of the Dark Lady with his outrageous and clearly false, Tales of the Tropics. Oh, his young heart, oh, the giddiness, the mad beating. He fell before her, fell at her golden feet. She raised him with strong arms of gold. They fell into swans down behind curtains of silver silk. And there was the promise that when the moment came, and soon, too soon it must come, he would be possessed of all time's secrets, and his very mouth grow golden and utter speech for which the very gods waited and would be silent to hear. This vision, inspired by the drunk Hobie, foreshadows W.S.'s meeting with the Dark Lady of the Sonnets in London. Burgess names his dark lady Fatima, claiming that Shakespeare had subconsciously included parts of her name acrostically in one of his sonnets. This is a rather tenuous observation by Burgess, 
but it highlights his use of the Dark Lady in creating W.S.'s fictional biography. W.S. meets Fatima while out walking and begins an affair with her. Burgess presents her as a major love of Shakespeare's life because of the evidence in the sonnets, evidence that has long been disputed by Shakespeare scholars and biographers. Some claim the Dark Lady is Mary Fitton, a maid of honour to the Queen. Some say Mistress Dananont, the wife of an innkeeper on the road between London and Stratford. The Dark Lady sonnet sequence inspires both Burgess's fictional biography of Shakespeare during his time in London and the bawdy tone of the novel. Take, for instance, Sonnet 151, which talks about the Dark Lady's infidelity in lustful and bawdy terms. Love is too young to know what conscience is, yet who knows not conscience is born of love? Then, gentle cheater, urge not my amass, lest guilty of my faults thy sweet self prove. For thou betraying me, I do betray my nobler part to my gross body's treason. My soul doth tell my body that he may triumph in love. Flesh stays no farther reason, but rising at thy name doth point out thee as a triumphant prize. Proud of his pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be, to stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. No want of conscience hold it that I call her love, for whose dear love I rise and fall. Here the narrator of the sonnet is admonishing his love, the dark lady, for her infidelity but it also talks suggestively of sexual arousal and lust. Burgess uses this sonnet to inspire his telling of Fatima's affair with the Earl of Southampton, putatively the fair youth of the earlier sonnets. Added to this is Burgess's bawdy, which smothers W.S.'s relationship with sexual explicitness in much the same tone as Shakespeare's own writing. In this extract from Nothing Like the Sun, W.S. reacts to the news that Fatima may be involved with his friend, the Earl of Southampton or Mr. W.H. To her to rail, beat, near kill, she screams, her wrists cracking in my grip, that she has done naught wrong, but she will do wrong as she wishes. I rip at her bodice, tear, wrench, gnash, chew. Her maid, fearful of her mistress's safety, batters the locked door, but I shriek terrible curses and she departs, going, oh, oh, fearful for the safety of herself. The transports I now enter are a burning hell of pleasure. If before we have soared and flown, now we burrow, eyes and nose holes and snoring mouths filled with earth and worms and scurrying atomies, all of which are transformed to a heavy though melting jelly of pounded red flesh mixed with wine. We dig with pioneering wings down towards the fire that is the whole earth's centre, nub, quaint, meaning. At the seventh approach to dying, my loins scraped raw, she sinking to a howling, sweat-gleaming brown-gold phantom. I fancy that the ceiling opens by some quaint shutter device to reveal a pearl intaglio heaven. Watching bright-eyed like a pack of foxes, God, the father beard-stroking party beard, Saints with uncouth names like devils all about. Saint Anguish, Saint Sithagrand, Saint Ishik, Saint Rosario, Saint Canipple, Saint Pogue, Plumpy Bacchus with pink eyne. Leaping around the bed is a cherub demon that is Mr. W.H. Crying, do this and that and more. I would learn, I would be shown. I show him. And after, in a cold and rainy May evening, I sit in mine own lodgings, feeling truly in a wretched dim hell of mine own making, spent, used, shameless, shameful. The biography of W.S. in Nothing Like the Sun is not only influenced by Shakespeare's own literary output, but it's filtered through a unique narrator. 
The novel takes the form of a farewell lecture of a drunken university tutor. While he is speaking to his class, a cohort of students from the East, probably Malaya, he is drinking samsu, a fermented rice wine. As the lecture goes on, elements of the classroom are brought into the story of Shakespeare. For example, in the previous extract, the saints, Anguish, Rosario, Canipple, Ishak, etc., are the names of the students being lectured to. Eventually the lecturer succumbs to his drunkenness and the narration becomes fragmented and thick with pseudo-Elizabethan poetry. Not only is this a postmodern twist on the historical novel, but it speaks of Burgess's history as a teacher. Throughout his career, Burgess would find himself in the classroom, often teaching the works of Shakespeare. After a number of years as a schoolmaster in England, Burgess moved to Malaya. In 1954, he took up a post at the Malay College teaching English literature. Among other things, it was his job to make Shakespeare relevant to his Malayan students and their culture. This is something he dramatises in Nothing Like the Sun, making the Dark Lady of the Sonnets Malayan and hinting that she carried Shakespeare's child back to the mysterious East. After his time in Malaya, Burgess took up several teaching posts in various different world locations. His enthusiasm for Shakespeare never waned, particularly when it came to the Bard's use of language. In a school textbook called English Literature, written during his time in Malaya and primarily for his Malayan students, Burgess writes about his love of Shakespeare's language. Words are all important to Shakespeare. Not just or even primarily the meaning of words, but the sound of words. Shakespeare wanted to batter or woo or enchant the ears of his audience with language, and in any one of his plays, early or late, the word hordes are open wide and the gold scattered lavishly. But the words still pour out. There is never any impression of careful, slow composition, the leisurely search for the right word. We have it on the evidence of Hemming and Condell, and also Ben Jonson, that Shakespeare wrote with great speed and facility, rarely crossing anything out. This explains a certain impatience with language. Shakespeare often cannot wait for the right word to come, and so invents a word of his own. As Burgess continued teaching Shakespeare's literature, he became more interested in how the plays would have been performed to their Elizabethan audiences. Not only did his classes consist of discussion about the language written on the page, but also about how the words were spoken. Burgess described Shakespeare's English as a cross between American, Warwickshire and some Lancashire thrown in. In 1973, while teaching at City College in New York, Burgess gave a lecture on Shakespearean language. This is an extract of that lecture, with Burgess reading from Hamlet in his attempt at original pronunciation. I heard they spake me a speech once, uh, but it was never acted, or if it was, not above once. For the play, I remember, plays not the million, uh, t'was caviar to the general. But it was, as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the tap of mine, and an excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much majesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no silence in the lines to make the matter savoury, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved, t'was Inés tale to Dida, and there a book of it, especially, where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line, let me see, let me see, the rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast, tis not so it begins with Pyrrhus, the rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arm, black as his purpose, did the knights resemble, when he lay coochered in the ominous horse, hath new this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot, new is he total ghouls, hurriedly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and damned light to their vile murders, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus oversized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam, seeks, so proceed you. 
Columbus. For God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. First play. Anon he finds him striking too sharp at Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal match, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming tap, stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash, takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky aid of Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But Burgess's interest in Shakespeare was not purely academic or literary. In 1967, Burgess was approached by Warner Brothers to write a Hollywood musical based on Shakespeare's life. Because of copyright issues, the film had to be substantially different from Nothing Like the Sun, so Burgess engaged in writing a new story for the screenplay. This script is known by two names. The studio's preferred title, The Bawdy Bard, and Burgess's, Will. The script, beginning with Shakespeare on his deathbed, surrounded by friends and family, does have similarities to the novel, and is written in a similarly bawdy style. From the initial scene, the screenplay is then told in flashback, detailing events from Shakespeare's life, including his friendship with the Earl of Southampton and his love affair with the Dark Lady, here called Lucy. It also includes aspects that would later become familiar through Burgess's Christopher Marlowe novel, A Dead Man in Deptford, such as the rival playwright and the spies, Poli, Freiser and Skiers. The action, following Shakespeare's life in both Stratford and London, is intercut with songs by Burgess himself, such as this, Shakespeare's Boys. <laughs> We are Shakespeare's boys, lads whom master will employ. We will hold your horse if you pay, of course. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You must pay a penny and we get for our pains just a little farthing. Oh, thank you, your lordship. Will gets what remains. Will gets what remains. Will gets what remains. This film project never came to anything because of a change in management at the studio. But Burgess claims it was set to star Maggie Smith as Anne Hathaway and her real-life husband, Robert Stevens, was to play Shakespeare. Burgess's musical version of Shakespeare's life would, in 1979, mutate into the score for Mr. W.S., a ballet on the career of William Shakespeare. Here, the compositions were a much grander affair, as this extract shows. Burgess was clearly more interested in trying to understand the man who wrote the plays than the plays themselves, and attempted to articulate this interest in a variety of media. In 1970, Burgess wrote that given the choice between discovering an unknown Shakespeare play or one of Will's laundry lists, he would plump for the dirty washing every time. It was important for Burgess to claim some sort of ownership over Shakespeare, to make the bard his bard. Often, 
Burgess deliberately mixes Shakespeare with a thinly veiled cipher of himself. For example, the university lecturer who claims his life of Shakespeare is ventriloquial. There is an even more overt example of Burgess blending his own character with that of Shakespeare in the novel Enderby's Dark Lady. Inspired by the failure of Burgess's film script, it tells a story of the dirty poet Enderby as he attempts to write a stage musical that has many similarities with the bawdy bard. This misadventure ends with Enderby forced to play the lead role. After the performance, he gazes at himself in the mirror while in full costume. He does not see himself, but the real Shakespeare, who looks at Enderby from the mirror and coldly nods. This scene helps dramatise Burgess's complicated and ever-changing relationship with William Shakespeare. Listen now to this sonnet. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever love. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast was written and presented by Graham Foster. Readings were by Ben Jewell and Adam Murray. All of the music was composed by Anthony Burgess. For more information, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.